be with you tonight. We are, Lord willing, we're going to finish up Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. So last time we were, uh, we were looking at the train that was bound for glory in the various stops, right? The foreknowledge, predestination, the calling, justification, and then glorification. You ever heard that song? This train is bound for glory. This train. This train is bound for glory. Ain't nobody on it but the righteous and the holy. <laughs> the distant relatives of mine used to sing that song. Yeah. Um, so uh, we are, we're going to be down um, tonight covering verses 32 uh, to the end of the chapter. Um, but before that, does anybody have any questions about that? That material that we talked about last time, foreknowledge, predestination. Oh, can okay, I, y'all can, y'all can, can teach I me. <laughs> yeah, I'd just like to, to thank you this morning. I don't know if everybody was here for answering that question. That, like I said, you know, sometimes people are so smart that they, you, you know what, I was telling Pig coming uh, I don't know if everybody heard the question asked, but I run across a thing that was in Matthew about where uh, it said uh, Jesus, where Jesus said that he was the son uh, of the living God. And I, and I asked Kathy, I said, I don't understand what living God means. I said, I've always heard it, but I didn't know exactly what it meant. So I went on the computer and I asked the computer what it means, and I got all kinds of answers. <laughs> when I got done, I still didn't know what I wanted to try. Really confused. So I, 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 I thought, well, uh, uh, David and Casey, uh, but I don't know, I just kind of dismissed it because I said, I don't know when I get have the opportunity to ask them. Come church this morning, guess what the first verse you read was? <laughs> that verse out of the Bible. And I said, well, God, God said, well, I just laid it out there before you asked them. So that's what I done. And the answer, when it was all done, when y'all got done, it made perfect sense. What worried me was that one of these days, somebody might come up to me and say, well, I don't understand what does living God mean? You know, and I would, and you know, that's not a question that somebody asks you that you don't want to be answered. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, that answer that I got made perfect sense. Because I was telling Pig, did everybody hear what his answer was? It was here this morning. Anybody didn't hear what he said? The living, the living God, when I get, when I listen to that, if you're talking to idols, I told Pig coming up the road, say your car is your idol. That's a good one to pick on. Everybody likes your car. If your car starts talking back to you, <laughs> you need to go see Pig. <laughs> <laughs> but the living God means that God actually talks to you. He talks back to us. We can talk to Him. Your car, you can't talk to your car and it talks back. If it does, you may lose your case. But your God can talk to you. And that makes perfect sense to me. And that's something that you can relate to people. People can relate if, if they can relate to any of it. Some people never relate to any of it, but that made perfect sense. I just appreciate that. that well, thank you. Because I didn't give up on the, on the computer answering it. I read it for half an still done. Yeah. Google is not a good Bible scholar. Good Bible scholar. The reference I, I made um, to, to Dagon falling on his face before the Ark of the Covenant, that's in 1 Samuel chapter. I have a habit, I, <clears throat> depending on what Bible I'm using, I can typically, I can, I know where it is in space. Right? I can flip to it, but to quote an actual chapter and verse, um, that takes a lot more work for me. But when I have my Bible, I can usually, um, usually flip to it in, in space. But yeah, I appreciate that. The Lord is good. Um, that, that reminds me of a, a pastor friend of ours. Um, people would come to him and express, you know, they were, they were called to the ministry, they were 
trying to make a decision about whether or not to to go to seminary and you know they say well, well to to preach the word what do i need to do well read read the bible okay well after i do that what what do i need to do <laughs> read, read the bible, the bible. <laughs> okay well, well then then what after that what do i need to read now read the bible read the god the holy spirit will teach us he'll show us and he'll do things like that this this morning that's what it's all about we come to sunday school and we share and we teach one another and and learn from one another, and it's, it's, it's just good. It's well, you know, good. I've heard people, lots of people say, well, I don't need to go to church, uh, you know, that, but that's why you need to go to church. To grow. Because there's people in this church that, that know things that you don't know, and I, there's things in here that you may know that other people know, but that's the idea of church, is get church people together and talk to one another and learn things that, and, and understand things that make sense. <coughs> I don't, I don't believe like the computer. It's, it's got a bunch of people in there, probably very, very smart people. But that don't mean to know a whole lot about the church. Amen. You need to get with people from the church that, that like church and willing to study about it and understand it, you know, and, and then you'll, you'll, you'll start grasping things a lot better. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's why we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. God has a plan and a purpose, and um, he, he doesn't put anything in, in his word that he doesn't want us to know and understand and um, learn from and apply it, apply it to our lives so that we can live faithfully. Well, you know, another thing that, that, that in the church that I've learned, ask questions. If you don't understand it, ask questions. Mm -hmm. We're not going to, the church is not going to jump on you. Amen. If you don't understand it, ask. Amen. Don't sit there and not, not understand it. Ask. You can tell. I don't, I don't mind asking. <laughs> and, and we don't want to be at the mercy of Google. That's <laughs> just the word of God. Yeah. If y'all notice, Peggy said amen on that one. <laughs> talking about foreknowledge um, you know there's an idea that foreknowledge and predestination is the same thing uh, basically that cuts out uh, free will um, if you were at the tent meeting you're at the revival you you can see what God does with that free will he is still sovereign and him giving us gifting us free will does not alter his mercy his love his mm -hmm. sovereignty one bit but I want to I want to make a point because um, you know, there's there's not an equivalence, and sometimes people use that uh, that that God uh, foreknows and predestines everything, including sin, evil, reprobation. Um, so, if you'll turn with me to First Samuel chapter twenty-three, First Samuel chapter twenty-three, and then. Uh, So to set up the, the context here, um, the, the Philistines came up against this, uh, this fortress, uh, Keilah, uh, they're, they're robbing it, and so David goes and, uh, and he helps them out, right? He goes and, and rescues them, um, and, and David is there, and he's with his men, and Saul catches wind uh, that... David is there at, at Keilah. Um, and so, well, chapter 23, verse 7. Um, it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah, and Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town that has gates and bars. Okay, so he was going to be trapped. He was going to be stuck. And Saul called all the people together to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. Then in verse 9, uh, so David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. I love the King James English. <laughs> he's, he's got all the people at war. They're coming for him, and that's, uh, that's mischief. Um, and he said uh, to Abiathar the priest, bring hither the ephod. Okay, so the ephod, um, this, is, this is a tool that they use to talk to God, to ask God something. You, you had... You had that, and there's a connection there. If you remember the the Urim and the Thummim, this uh, you know whatever they were, we don't really know what they were. They just were behind the breastplate of the high priest. But um, whatever this this the 
device, technology, whatever it was, they yeah. were they were talking of God. Since we got the Holy Ghost, didn't that replace the ephod? Ephod? Yeah, we we don't we don't need the uh, divine dice anymore. We can just pray and, and, right. and talk to God. But you know, it's similar to kind of casting lots and and things like that. Um, but. Uh, David needs to talk to God. And so then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. So he asked God, Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? Okay. O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Uh, then said David, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver thee up. Um, so God sees what's going to happen. David asked God, all right, so God foreknew that Saul's coming and uh, the men of Keilah are going to betray David. So is that what happened? Next verse. Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah. It did not happen. <laughs> God foreknew it. Uh, he told David, David needs feet, and they're gone. Um, so foreknowledge and predestination are not the same thing. Right? So David had knowledge from God. He exercised his free will. Now, did God know what David was going to do? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely he knew what he was going to do. Um, but God uses things like that, and, and there are things that, that are going to remain a mystery until uh, we hit glory. Uh, but he gives us glimpses. He gives us insights. Um, all right, so moving on to glory, Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 32 through the end of the chapter. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Gets real good here. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Notice these are all things in the world. These are, these are man-made things. Verse 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. He's kicked it up a notch. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, so to summarize that text, Paul is resorting to one of his favorite uh, styles of rhetoric or argument. Uh, he's offering one of his how much more arguments. So if God did not hold back his son for our sake, why would he stint on anything else? Verse 32. Note that he freely gives us all things. All things work together for good. And all things includes the entire cosmos and all of history. So who's going to be able to bring a successful charge against God's elect, against his church, against his children? God's the one who's justified us, right? So condemnation has no place to stand because Christ died and rose and ascended and is praying for us right now. Verse 34. So what that means, who, who's going to bring a successful charge? Well, what's the, um, what does Satan mean? Satan means accuser. So this means that because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Satan is out of a job um, because God has justified us in him. Christ prays for us because he loves us, verse 34 to 35. And what can get in between us and that love? Well, it's a rhetorical question, and the answer is absolutely nothing. To drive home the point, Paul runs through a list of possible contenders, things that might attempt to drive a wedge between the believer 
and Christ in order to make some room for condemnation. So, Paul says, give it your best shot. Bring out your champions. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. The answer comes back, of course not. Of course not to all of them. Verse notice, 35. That all of those things are man or human things, mm -hmm. not God things. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's what I noticed about them. Mm -hmm. They're all human things. Yeah, not we, just, God's not standing there and got something that you can't get through. It's, got, it's all about us. We, he can't get through to us because of whatever this is. Yeah, he, um, in his providence, God allows you know, Satan to stir things up. When he stirs things up, it, these are people doing that to mm -hmm. each other. Man's inhumanity to man. Mm -hmm. So these are not just academic questions for the righteous. Um, Paul is actually quoting uh, several places here um, in these last verses. He's quoting from Isaiah. He's quoting from um, Psalm 110, uh, 44. Um, but in all these things, Paul says, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. Paul is convinced of this, and he's fully persuaded, uh, and he works through another list of challengers, even more comprehensive than the first. Um, so, uh, can anything separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord? Verse 39, no. What sorts of things cannot bring about such a separation? Well, death can't do it. Uh, life can't do it. Angels are not up to it, and neither are principalities or powers. Verse 38. Nothing that is happening right now can do it, and neither can anything that might happen in the future. High things can't do it, and deep things can't do it. And to fill out the list, nothing created can do it. Did Paul forget anything? Did he leave anything out? No. There's nothing in creation, uh, nothing under God that can separate us from his love and from Christ Jesus. Um, so in, in order for this argument to work at all, uh, we have to be talking about people who are, um, who are in Christ. Um, Paul is being more pointed and specific here than he was, let's say, in Colossians uh, chapter 3, verse 12. Um, so we've got this su succession from foreknowledge to glorification. And, um, you know, once we, are, once we are on that train, we can't get off. Once we belong to Christ, we are there. And there is nothing uh, that can happen to us that would ever be able to take us out of his hand. Um, you know, Paul gives us the first list. He's still not satisfied. Um, and and he, so he, he adds the second list um, to cover the entirety of uh, creation. So I want to point out some of the things that were quoted uh, from the Old Testament. So verse 33, uh, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Um, let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50. see that it's very plainly talking about the Lord Jesus. Or rather, it is the Lord Jesus who is speaking through the mouth of the prophet. All right, so let's take a look. Uh, Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. See if this sounds familiar. <coughs> I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. All right. uh, this is Jesus talking. All right, here in the middle of Isaiah, in the Old Testament, um, and, and just to point out something, after the resurrection, uh, those who had been closest to him had a hard time figuring out who he was. They didn't recognize him. Um, it may, this, this may give us some insight into why they didn't recognize him. Uh, he, may have, he may have been so disfigured that they couldn't tell who he was. Um, and we are, we are not going to know on this side of the grave, the extent uh, to what Christ actually did 
for us uh, when he took on humanity. Can I put in a plug right there? Uh, I've told you all this before, but if if you get the chance, it's about a 50-minute message sermon. John Phillips preaches a message on Psalm 24, and if you study your Bible, you can't read Psalm 23 without 22 and 24. But I encourage you for that very statement that they could not recognize him. David saw what happened after he ascended. The disciples didn't, but almost a thousand years before David in Psalm 24 seen, and, and he points out that very fact that Jesus Christ in a man's body stood outside of the gates of that city as disfigured until he became glorified. Yeah. And that, when you said that, that just, if it's Psalm 24, John Phillips, and if you don't know who John Phillips is, he's the great, one of the greatest commentators of the 20th century. And he puts that all into perspective. Verse 7, for the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded, therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Um, and, and just verse 11 for fun. Behold, all ye that kindle a fire, that compass yourselves about with sparks, walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks that ye have kindled. Uh, and that's what they're up to next door, at Awana, with the sparkies and the rest of them. You know, kindling that fire. <laughs> Amen. Uh, um, so here we see that he allowed um, his abusers to pull out his beard. He set his face like flint. Um, there's a cross-reference there for Luke chapter 9, 51. So this means that this particular triumphant cry, God is the one who justifies, so who can condemn? This is found first in the mouth of the Lord Jesus here in Isaiah. And because he can speak in that way, all who are in him are invited to do the same. We repeat these words after Christ Jesus speaks them. Um, verse 34 who is he that condemneth? Uh, it is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Um, so Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. According to Paul here, Christ's position at the right hand of the Father is not a position detached from earthly affairs. He is ruling from that place, and he is interceding for his saints on earth from that privileged position. Uh, thus it is that he will, through his efficacious prayers for his church on earth, overcome all his enemies. And he will be there at the right hand of the Father, Father until that moment comes, and then he will return. Um, I was thinking about Aaron Rodgers, this idea that um, he intercedes for his saints on earth, in a privileged position, and uh, we are there with him, right? He is interceding for us um, as he was, was died on the cross, was buried and rose again. So do we, as he sits on the right hand of the Father, so do we. So Aaron Rodgers says, uh, in justification, we didn't just get a pardon, we got a promotion. Amen. Thirty-six, um, as, it, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Uh, this is coming out of uh, Psalm 44. Um, yes, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. That is Psalm 44, verse 22. Uh, this citation provides us with a striking juxtaposition. Paul is exulting in the triumph of belonging to God's elect and says that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, the context of the quote expresses feeling uh, more pressed by the affliction. Um, Awake, why do you sleep, O Lord? Rise up, do not cast us off forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? Uh, Psalm 44. Uh, these responses are not really two different answers to one dilemma. Rather, they are one answer that Paul provides at the end of this chapter is the answer that God has finally provided uh, to the lament of the psalmist. Um, 
It's a lament from righteous martyrs. And God has delivered them mightily in the past, but now God had turned them over to their enemies, and so they were suffering terribly. Um, still in Psalm 44. However, where you would expect to find a confession of sin, we find a protestation of innocence. These are Old Testament saints. These are the righteous ones. But the exaltation of Christ in history has made a difference. It is not a difference between unrighteousness and righteousness, but there is yet a difference between bewildered righteousness and triumphant righteousness. The Christ who reigns and who prays for us and who is at the right hand of God is the same Christ who was delivered up. He is the one who died. Now, in the light of that gospel, we have had it revealed to us that this thing called self-sacrifice is a weapon that completely undoes the machinery of the world. Those who are worldly wise don't know what to do with it. They have no countermeasure to it. And so we are more than conquerors because Christ was more than a conqueror. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul has moved from a failure to be conquered uh, to a success in conquering. Uh, the decrees of God are not just great on defense. Uh, what is it that overcomes the world? Is it not our faith? In and through the church, the decrees of God will triumph in the world. Uh, please remember that Paul is not talking about an invisible, spiritual, 17th dimension victory in some other place and time, a place that historians will never find. No, he is not seeing mystic visions about some other spiritual never-never land. No. We pray weekly for the kingdom to come, for God's will to be done. Where? Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Uh, and that's, that's what, part of what I was mentioning this morning uh, in Caesarea Philippi and the gates of hell. Um, you know, gates tend to, tend to keep things in. And we, we read that verse in Matthew chapter 16. And the gates of hell will not prevail against the, the church. And, and we almost get the feeling that, well, we're going to be over here and, you know, trying to stand fast. And then Satan's going to come and whoop us with a gate. No, uh, that's not how it works. Um, Jesus kicked that gate in uh, and the church follows him. Where he mm -hmm. goes, we go. Uh, and so that was the last defense that <coughs> Satan had left. And his power has been utterly destroyed um, and so we are more than conquerors so we started out um, that there is no condemnation at the beginning of chapter 8 uh, and now we end up with who can possibly condemn us who can possibly uh, separate us from the love of God we know if Jesus has the keys to the gates of hell Satan doesn't even have the he doesn't even have the key to his own door keys to his own house that's right, Amen. That's right. questions comments reflections so for those that weren't here this morning in Sunday school um, reiterate about Caesarea Philippi and the, the gates and, and what he meant by that statement to Peter and I think that's that was that's really good yeah, it's in Matthew chapter chapter 16. And, you know, we read we read the Bible and you say, okay, well, what, why would he tell us that he was in Caesarea Philippi? What, what, what good does that, that do me right now? But, you know, teachers over time, they start putting things together and, you know, it emphasizes the importance of the uh, New Testament. Uh, but as they... Um, Caesarea Philippi was uh, essentially, it's, it's north of the Sea of Galilee, so if you're looking at a map on your Bible, you can probably see it. Uh, it was the um, area that in the Old Testament is referred to as Bashan, okay? So they're wandering out in the wilderness, outside the camp. That's where bad stuff is, right? That's where you, you know, they sent that scapegoat and they kicked it out of the camp. And the Old Testament says, uh, this one is for Azazel, all right? So, there was apparently a, a, a demon, some entity that, that had a name, right? And this goes back all to the sons of God and the Nephilim, uh, what God was um, pronouncing judgment on, on these, um, whatever these divine creatures were that fell. Um, it all harkens back to that. Bashan was where they lived, right? 
and in a, a place called Mount Hermon, you'll probably see that on one of your Bible maps. Uh, that has significance in the Old Testament. And uh, it, was, it was called the, the Land of the Serpents, uh, and Mount Bashan was known as the, the Gates of, of Hell, the Gates of Sheol, uh, depending on the reference. Um, so uh, what does Jesus tell um, when, when Peter answers, whom, whom, whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Um, and Jesus says, uh, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. And I say to you, unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uh, so where were they when Jesus said that? They were at the gates of hell. Um, they were specifically. So Jesus went there specifically to provoke. Right? So all the, you, you know, Old Testament, you don't see any, much about demons popping up. And then Jesus comes on the scene, and it's like they're everywhere. <laughs> it's like a demonic, uh, talk about a pandemic. They, they had them <laughs> around Galilee um, about 2,000 years ago. Um, so what was that, right? And the, the whole temptation of Jesus, it's like this fishing expedition uh, that Satan is asking these questions. He's trying to, he's, he's fishing for information. He's trying to figure out what the Son of the Most High is doing here on earth. Uh, and it's, it's making, you know, it's shaking things up. Uh, and then Jesus goes uh, to this place, this specific place, uh, and, and that is where uh, he builds his church, right? He's founding it on this statement uh, that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. Uh, and he is, uh, he is provoking um, the, the forces of, of evil, the unseen realm, Satan, uh, into action. Right. Shortly thereafter, Jesus starts telling them, look, I'm, you know, I'm going to have to suffer things uh, from the elders and the priests and the scribes, the religious people, and be killed and be raised again on the third day. Uh, he begins to teach them and show them that. But this is Jesus Christ orchestrating his own crucifixion. Uh, right. There was nothing that caught him by surprise. Um, you know, Judas, uh, he tells Judas, what you're going to do, do, go do it. Go do it now. Um, and, and Judas does. Um, well, you know, I never thought about it like that before. What, what you were talking about, Satan didn't Satan didn't know what Jesus was here for. Right. He, you know, I always thought, well, I just never thought about it that way. That here's Jesus popped up. He knew who he was. And he's saying, well, I got to figure this out. What's, what's he doing here? I thought I had all this. I thought I had this world. This world was mine. I had it forever. What's he doing here? And then I, I assume he knows now. It's <laughs> 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 good. Like it is, but back then he didn't. Good probability. Yeah, well, I think that's the point. You know, had, um, Paul makes that point. Had, had they known, right, had Satan known what he was doing, he would not have done. They would, they would not have, you know. Yeah, he was just blundering around and some yeah. other guy got him in trouble. You know, Jesus is going to the cross and Satan thinks, okay, I've, I've got this thing licked. I've got it won now. He had no idea that death was going to bring about life to the entire world. It's like what you say. If he had known what that was going to happen, he would have been trying to keep Jesus alive. Right. And, you know, he's, you know, the Pride, the blinders, the hatred of man, the hatred of God. Um, you know, it's showing them, you know, it must be about power. Right? <laughs> what, what can you do? Jump off the building, I'll give you all these kingdoms. Um, and Jesus completely refutes it all with the word of, of God. Um, well, Satan, when you hear when you hear what you just said and then put it together, Satan thought he was here for power too. Mm -hmm. Apparently he didn't realize that he was here. To take him down. And that's probably a moment in time. He thought, well, he's here to get power. And that's why he was offering him power. That's probably a moment in time where Satan had a had a checkup and he thought, maybe I should have stayed, <laughs> stayed put. <laughs> you know, pride makes us pride makes us think we can That's right. Um, you know, and he was full of pride, so he was he's probably thinking he already mm -hmm. had everything taken. You know, in him. Isaiah he says, I yeah. me. So many times you can see the pride just building and building and building. 
And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, as best we can tell and scholars can tell, he, he was the he was the third man on the totem pole, so to speak, as far as the angels are concerned. And well, uh, you, you know what we were talking about there? I said, well, Satan doesn't even have the gate. He didn't even have the key to his own gate on the house. And you know, he probably did before Jesus showed up. And he, I appreciate that the other night when when the brother played that song. And you know, that was very eye opening for a lot of people. Most people never heard anything like that in 1979. The devil's not some little red cow with horns and a pitchfork. His name meant angel of light. Many believe he was the choir leader of heaven. What's the best way to entice the human mind? Music. 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 Well, you know, and it has. And it has. Yeah. I don't care. I don't care. I Me and Miss Carolyn was talking about it. I don't care if you like rock music or, or bluegrass or country or whatever. But if you would cut the lyrics out of that song, it has one of the most catchiest beats. And I thought while I was sitting there, especially those that grew up through that, I, there was a part of you. If you're being honest with yourself and honest for God, you almost tapped that foot or patted that leg or caught rhythm with that beat. And I thought about that as that song was played. How many people in that crowd almost mm -hmm. got in rhythm with just the music? Didn't have to have no words, just the just the beat of the music. You know, I was thinking about that Bible verse you were talking about, about David and, and the mischief and stuff, and it reminded me of what David used to do for Saul when he played his harp. It calmed Saul down. You know, a lot of gospel music, when you're listening to it and it's praising the Lord, and it's all about the Lord, it does soothe your soul and it makes a joyful countenance. Yeah. But you can go and you can listen to, you know, songs out in the world, you know, country music. If you're going through a hard time, those things can put you in bondage and you'll be looking back before you start looking forward because, you know, the achy, breaky hearts and things like that. It can really, if you're an emotional person, which I'm a crazy emotional person, but... But at the same time, you can really get stuck it in can. a bondage of, of, you know, oh, he hurt me, he said, she said, all this other stuff. But if you can get those things out of your life and focus on Christ and his music and the things that people are trying to give honor and glory to, boy, what a joy steps in because it's about the Lord. It's no longer about us. And it reminds me, that's, I, I kind of wonder why they said mischief in there because David may have, you know, had his little teeny miniature heart to play for Saul to calm him down, you know, because... He was after him, you know, and then when David would play his harp, his soul was soothed through David's playing. So it just kind of, it was just a kind of one of those comical things. And if you don't think music plays a part, a big part, yeah. let's see if I can remember this. Turn to 2 Kings. I don't know, we got to finish up, but 2 Kings chapter number 3. I believe this word is. Let me make sure. Chapter number three. Yeah. Second Kings chapter number three. Elijah is standing there. And notice what Elijah, which was a preacher, a man of God, notice what he says in verse 15. But now bring me a what? Minstrel. You know what that is? A musician. Notice what it says. And it came to pass when the minstrel what? Played. The hand of the Lord came upon him. <laughs> the music is a gift from God. And so Amen. all of God's good gifts, Satan's going to manipulate and try to counterfeit. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. You talk about tapping the, tapping the foot. You know, that's, that's what Paul's talking about, that battle against the, the flesh. Uh, we've got these, you know, there's, there's connections in uh, in our neurons. Um, it's like grooves in a record. Uh, they're there. You know, we just have to try to make make new grooves. Um, so the more we spend in His Word and in prayer, that's how we make those different grooves. You know, God must like music. Didn't it say that Satan was a musical instrument? He was created as a musical instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he had good. 
he was shiny and had good pipes and yeah. all that kind of stuff. God, just like you, you if you live in the beach. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But, but you know, some things may start making some sense. When you, when you said Satan didn't know what was past, you know, Jesus went to Hades and, did, and there were, it said that God give, give Jesus his keys to hell. That, ain't that what they said? Yeah, the old right the old there, I'm just thinking, right there is when Satan said, oh, wait a minute, it's starting to make sense now. <laughs> you know, that, he, didn't, he didn't know what was going on probably. So when he, when, Je, when the Lord handed Jesus them keys, apparently Satan had them, and he gave them to Jesus. He said, "Right there, wait a minute here. I, I done messed up big time here." And that, and that's the march through history. How do you, how do you get, you know, twelve men that start in the upper room, and before long. The empire that's Amen. been persecuting them uh, has bent the knee to, to Christ Jesus, and and it spreads throughout the in, the entire world. Um, you know, it is it is good and powerful, and God is good and powerful. Um, you know, it's it's something to say that, and I know we got to go, but I'll stay here all night. We'll go. Me too. <laughs> you was talking about looking at your maps this morning, uh, and it's. This Bible doesn't have it, but the one I had this morning did. It showed, the title of it was The Spread of the Gospel. I've never seen that before till in that particular Bible. And it showed just a bleed of red out from the nation of Israel into Asia Minor and Italy and all that. And I thought, you know what? How far has it bled out? You know, it, it's covered the globe with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wonderful. So let's go out this week and do the same. Amen. Um, Amen. We, we, we are more than conquerors because he is more than Amen. conquerors. Let us pray. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together uh, to open your word, Lord. Uh, thank you for revealing uh, your perfect plan, your power, your grace, your mercy, and your peace to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord, and his death, burial, and resurrection. And we look forward to his returning, Lord. Now I just ask that you bless each one here throughout the week, Lord, that we would be uh, proper ambassadors uh, for you and your kingdom, Lord, uh, that we, too, uh, would be representatives uh, of the gospel, ministers of reconciliation uh, to a lost world, Lord. Just pray that you would give us the strength and let us remain uh, ever faithful, Lord, um, and in our remembrance of your perfect love for us, Lord. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.